I'm sure all of you have your doubts about something. Perhaps you doubt that Neil Armstrong actually walked on the moon. Perhaps you doubt the world will actually come to an end in 2012. Perhaps you doubt your own ability to understand ethics, and so on. But I've got news for you. When it comes to doubting, you're all amateurs, each and every one of you. Indeed, you haven't encountered a real, true, pro-doubter until you've read Hume. Perhaps it was the kilt-wearing, haggis-eating, or sheep-herding, but this Scottish philosopher didn't accept anything at face value. He doubted everything. Indeed, Hume not only doubted the existence of the world around him, he doubted the very existence of matter. He not only doubted the existence of other people, he doubted the existence of himself. He not only doubted the hypothesis of a prime mover, he doubted the very concept of movement. So it should come as no surprise that Hume, in a Humean, all too Humean way, also cast doubt upon ethics. Indeed, Hume poses some very challenging problems to philosophical ethics as we have been discussing them this semester. And while I do not necessarily believe these challenges to be unanswerable, they are nevertheless too important for us to simply ignore. Hume's challenge to ethics begins with an investigation into the relationship between reason and action. Reason, Hume reasons, consists in our ability to determine truths and falsehoods, causes and effects. We use our reason, for instance, to discover truths such as 2 plus 2 equals 4 and tigers are members of the cat family. We also use reason to determine falsehoods such as 2 plus 2 equals 5 and golden retrievers are members of the cat family. Reason is also capable of investigating causes and effects. It can tell us, for instance, that gravity causes both leaping tigers and leaping golden retrievers to eventually fall back to the earth. So then, when we apply reason to ethical act, when we apply reason to action, it is similarly able to help us determine information concerning the facts and effects of our various actions. For instance, reason can determine the truth of the fact that the action of drinking coffee makes you feel awake. It can also prove that lifting weights has the effect of increasing muscle mass. However, Hume points out, this is as far as reason goes in regards to our action. Indeed, reason is limited to telling us the facts and effects of our action. It is not capable of motivating us towards particular actions. It can never, in other words, tell us which actions we ought to actually perform. For instance, while reason can determine that the action of drinking coffee wakes you up, it can say nothing about whether or not you should actually drink the coffee. Similarly, while reason can determine that lifting weights causes increased muscle mass, it cannot then recommend that we actually go and lift weights. Therefore, Hume reasons, there needs to be something else over and above reason to motivate us in our actions, something to tell us which actions we should perform, why we should do one thing rather than the other. This something Hume proposes is our passions, or we could say our desires and feelings. Indeed, while the, fact determ while the fact determined by reason that drinking coffee makes you feel awake does not motivate you to actually drink the coffee, your desire to stay awake does motivate you to drink the coffee. Similarly, it is ultimately not the fact that lifting weights causes increased muscle mass that leads us to lift weights, but rather our desire for increased muscle mass. What all this means, continues Hume, is that while reason may be able to give us information about actions, it is ultimately our passions, our desires, our feelings that motivate our action. Indeed, we ultimately act because of our passions. Reason, on the other hand, is merely a tool that assists these passions by determining the facts and effects of our various actions. Or, to put it in Hume's own words, when it comes to action, reason is, and ought to be, the slave of the passions. Okay, continues Hume, so now that we've reached this grand conclusion about the relationship between action and reason, we can narrow it down a bit. Namely, we can approach the relationship between reason, passion, and action once again, but this time with specifically ethical action in mind. So, starting back at the beginning, remember that reason ultimately works by determining the facts and effects of various actions. When these actions are ethical, reason thus works by determining the facts and effects of our ethical actions. So, for instance, our reason tells us things such as the world's rich have enough resources to keep the world's poor from starving, and effects such as consistent lying has the effect of decreasing happiness in the world. However, Hume continues, just as reason is unable to motivate us to action in general, so too our reason is unable to motivate us to action, motivate us to act ethically. This means that just as reason can tell us that coffee wakes you up, but cannot tell us to actually drink coffee, so too reason can determine that we can save the poor through resource donation, but cannot actually tell us to donate our resources. 
Similarly, reason can determine that consistent lying has the effect of decreasing happiness in the world, but it can in no way infer from this fact that we actually should tell the truth. Therefore, just as we need some sort of passion over and above our reason telling us which actions we ought to perform, so too we need some sort of passion over and above our ethical reason telling us which ethical actions we ought to perform. So, for instance, while the fact that consistent lying has the effect of decreasing happiness in the world does not motivate me to tell the truth, a passion for world happiness does motivate me to tell the truth. Similarly, the fact that I can save the poor through resource donation will only ever matter to me ethically if I first feel that the poor deserve to be saved and have a desire to help. Therefore, Hume concludes, ethical actions are ultimately motivated by our passions. It is our passions, in other words, that tell us which actions are ethically right for us to perform and which are ethically wrong for us to perform. Reason, on the other hand, is merely a tool that assists our passion in determining the best way to do the thing passion knows to be right. Once again, reason proves to be but a servant to the passions. Now, at first glance, Hume's conclusion here may seem rather innocent. However, the claim that passion, rather than reason, motivates ethical action has some radical implication. First and foremost among these is the implication that if Hume is correct in this claim, then statements of fact, statements using is, can never lead to claims of value, statements using ought. If you can't see why this is, remember that reason functions by determining facts, by telling us what something is. It tells us, for instance, that the stove is hot, that there is a way to prevent starvation, and so on. Claims about ethical action, on the other hand, are statements of value. They tell us what we ought to do. So, for instance, ethics claims that we ought to help the poor, that we ought to tell the truth, and so on. So then, since Hume's argument shows that reason cannot motivate ethical action, an implication of this is that the claims of reason, is claims, can never lead to ethical claims, ought claims. In short, Hume's argument shows that is can never lead to ought. However, Hume points out, this is precisely how all the philosophical ethics we have studied this semester function. Indeed, every major ethical system, in some way, attempts to move from claims about how the world is to claims about what we ought, therefore, to do. Utilitarianism, for instance, claims that because happiness is the only good, we ought to act so as to produce it. Kantianism claims that since a good will is the only good thing, we ought to act with it. Virtue ethics says that since it is good to have a good character, we thus ought to cultivate one. Therefore, if Hume is correct, all these brands of philosophical ethics show themselves to be misguided in their use of is claims to arrive at an ought claim. This is problematic for Hume, remember, because in order to move from is to ought, one must assume that reason is capable of motivating ethical action something that Hume's argument shows to be impossible. So then, to reiterate Hume's argument once more in brief, reason is incapable of motivating ethical action. It is incapable of telling us what we ought to do. However, philosophical ethics in all its forms attempts to use reason in just this way. It attempts to use reason to tell us what we ought to do. Therefore, all brands of philosophical ethics are misguided. Now, Hume's critique here is admittedly devastating for philosophical ethics, if it is in fact correct. I do not hope to challenge his critique today, but rather point out that even if it is correct, this does not necessarily mean that ethics must become a thing of the past. Indeed, remember that for Hume, it isn't that ethics don't exist, it's that there isn't such, it isn't that there isn't such a thing as right and wrong for Hume, it is merely that right and wrong are not determined by reason, but by our passions our feelings, and our desires. Hume would thus suggest that ethics, if it is to guide us in what we ought to do and how to live a good life, must stop relying on reason, must stop looking into the world around us for clues as to how we should act. Rather, ethics must start by looking into our own selves, our own souls. According to Hume, we must not investigate the world around us, but rather investigate our passions, our desires, and our feelings. We must investigate why we value the things we do, why we value things like happiness, and why we detest things like poverty, why we are disgusted by consistent liars. For Hume, it is here, in these primal and immediate passions, rather than in our cold and cult calculated reason, that ethics must begin and end.